and welcome to Brian Baptist Church. This is our Sunday school time, and I'm so glad you could be with us on this, what we call Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday for many of you. And so we're going to sing one chorus before we get into our Sunday school class. And that chorus is found right on this book here. It's a chorus called, I am the resurrection and the life. And we'll sing it through a couple times. It goes like this. Just wait until the children's class and we'll sing that one again. And we are now moving right on over here. And uh, we are hooking up right here. And we uh, are going to have, uh, we are going to have a word of prayer. So let's pray together. And we are going to get started. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this special day. Uh, this special day that is also an accounting. The account of the day that our Savior, your Son, rose from the dead, being second person of the Godhead. And we thank you that, that our Savior is now seated at your right hand, the right hand of power. We thank you for the power of resurrection. And we thank you for salvation. And we pray you would give us wisdom as we look into your class this morning. As we look into your word, help us with this class in Jesus' name. Amen. And for those of you at Berean Baptist Church, you have your Sunday school notes. Uh, but the title, this is the final lesson of this series um, of when Jesus says, look. And uh, the title of the message is, um, see the resurrected Christ. Amazing on the timing of that. And uh, next week we will start a new series. That new series will be in the book of First Corinthians. And we're going to be dealing with the need for clarity in God's church. And that'll be a new lesson starting next week. So by introduction, let me talk about what has taken place on this weekend so many years ago. In a 72-hour period, the disciples would go on the largest spiritual roller coaster in their lives. They would go uh, from ignorance to anguish to doubt and then to illumination. And the lesson we're about to hear right now, it proves how hard it is to see something unless you are actually looking for the right thing. And so you will be amazed at what the disciples did, what they didn't do, what they didn't get. And so look with me in the book of Luke, chapter 18. Word of God, the book of Luke, looking at chapter 18. And we're going to look at verse 31. And let me read this, and then I'm going to expound upon it for a little bit. Where the scripture says, then he took unto him the twelve and said unto him, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spit it on and they shall scourge him and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. This next verse is very intriguing. And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things which were spoken. And so this brings us to the first part of this lesson, the prophecy that could not be comprehended. 
Jesus is giving them a very near future prophecy of things that are going to very, very shortly come to pass. And, and it, let's break this down and look at everything first. First of all, Jesus told them to look. He said, behold. It'd be like your parents taking you aside and say, son, listen to me. It's the idea you want them to pay very careful attention. And so the concept of behold here is Jesus is saying to his disciples, please pay very careful attention to what I am about to tell you and look for these things to happen. So we assume at this point that the disciples are in complete focus of what Jesus is saying to them. Then Jesus also points this out to them, where it says this, And all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. So Jesus pointed them to the fulfillment of Scripture. That Scripture right now, uh, the Old Testament prophets, the prophecies of old, hundreds of years before, sometimes thousands of years before, are now just about ready to be fulfilled. And Jesus let them know, he said, all prophecies concerning him were now to be fulfilled. Of course, we now know he's referring to the prophecies regarding his first coming, not his second coming. And <clears throat> the disciples may have missed that, and there may have been some reasons that they did. They may have been, they, they probably were never ever trained in the concept of, of the Messiah coming and being a sacrificial lamb. It just wasn't in their, it wasn't in their wheelhouse or their thought process. So then we have, and <clears throat> turn with me to Mark chapter 10. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus carefully outlines this process. Mark chapter 10, verse 33, I love how incredibly detailed God is and Christ being the second person of the Godhead, he spills this out so very, very specifically. And he says, behold, we go up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit upon him, and shall kill him, and the third day he shall rise again. Now, I ask you, what part of that seems to you to be unclear? It seems to be very clearly spelled out. Jesus carefully outlined the process, and he described it point by point. First, He's going to be apprehended. Literally, the idea that he's going to be accosted, he's going to be incarcerated, he's going to be apprehended. Then secondly, remember there's a scripture in the Bible that says, he came unto his own and his own received him not. He here, he says he will be rejected by his own. It's the Jewish leaders, it's the religious leaders that are going to reject him. Then thirdly, he will be delivered to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles, we understand that, that was the Roman government, the Roman Empire. He's being <clears throat> delivered to the Roman judicial system. And then here's what happens. He will be mocked. He will be tortured. And he will be desecrated. The term desecrated gives when there's something precious and wonderful and pure and holy and is treated as an unholy thing. And when the soldiers spit upon Christ, they were literally desecrating the holy Son of God. And then it says, he will be killed. And we know that killing took place through the process of crucifixion. If you were ever to read Psalms 22, Psalms 22 gives a very, very clear description, point by point, of what it is like to be crucified, even though the process of crucifixion, which was developed by the Roman government, hadn't been developed at the time of that prophecy, wouldn't be developed for another 900 plus years. Years, and this shows you the incredible importance of God's word and that, by the way, when it comes to the word of God, every single prophecy will come to pass. 
The only thing that has to happen is for a person to be considered a, a false prophet is for one prophecy to be wrong. But none of the prophecies regarding the Son of God are going to be wrong. And then so he will be killed and then he will rise again the third day. Now, let's see again what the disciples' reaction was in Luke 18. And they understood none of those things. And this saying was hid from them, neither knew they the things that were spoken. Now, this might be a little bit perplexing. It's not perplexing that they didn't get part of it. It's perplexing that they didn't get any of it, none of it. Now, maybe that doctrine of the death, burial, and resurrection was so foreign to those who had been taught from their youth to look for a militant, conquering Messiah that would cast out the Romans. That was what they were taught in the synagogues. Uh, they were taught, we're going to get, the Messiah is going to come and overthrow this government and he will be in charge. Which, by the way, that will happen at the second coming of Jesus Christ. It was hard for them to picture that Christ was sacrificing to change the relationship between God and the entire world. And in the morning service, I will be talking a whole lot more about that. So the meeting was hidden from the disciples till later. So the first main point is it was the prophecy that could not be comprehended. But then secondly, Jesus later, he states the scriptural fulfillment. He literally tells them in real time at that time that the scripture is being fulfilled even as he speaks. Mark chapter 14, looking at verse 41, and this is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus has prayed. Uh, Jesus prayed for an hour, came back, the disciples were asleep. Jesus prayed for another hour, came back, the disciples were asleep. Jesus prayed a third hour, came back, guess what? The disciples were asleep. And so then he says this in verse 41. Then he cometh the third time and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. It is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. So right now he's saying, it's happening. It's happening. Everything that I told you, remember step one? Here's step one. It's coming. It's happening right now. Did they get it? Nope. It's as if Jesus is saying, look, everything I told you is starting to happen. But they did not get the picture to the point where in verse 50 it says, and they all forsook him and fled. Now let me say this by way of a parenthetical. In 9 to 12 hours, after a series of all-night interrogations and trials, in 9 to 12 hours from this point, Jesus would be crucified for the sins of all mankind. The sky would turn black, not from an astronomical event, but a supernatural lens would focus all the sins of all mankind that were committed for all time upon Christ at that very, very short span of time. That is what caused the sky to turn black. Jesus would die for our sins, shedding the blood of the perfect, spotless Lamb of God for atonement. Literally, Christ bearing our deserved eternal punishment, our eternal death for us, so that we could in turn have the opportunity to experience eternal life with him someday. So now we're going to fast forward to the third day that Jesus spoke about. Turn with me to Luke chapter 24. So looking in the book of Luke and looking at chapter 24, and let me read this passage, and I'm going to read it just 
uh, a little bit at a time. We're now dealing with the third point, the risen Christ. And there's two things that we need to look at regarding the risen Christ. First of all, we need to look to the message. We need to look to Christ's message, what he had said before. So look how things happen here. Now, upon the first day of the week, by the way, the first day of the week is Sunday. Now you understand why we meet on Sunday. Understand this, Saturday, the Sabbath was created for the Jews. Sunday, the first day of the week was created for the church. You do not find the Sabbath mentioned before the New Testament law, nor do you find a requirement for the Sabbath to be kept after Christ, the fulfillment of the Old Testament law. It's important to let the Bible say what it really says and not add things to it. So the first day of the week is when God's people, born again believers, every single Sunday is a memorial of Christ's resurrection of the dead. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. They brought spices. Here's what you, maybe you don't understand in the old days. A body died and it was anointed with spices to preserve the body, to keep the body from smelling bad. And then it was rolled together in cloth and then they would come back a day, they come back later and they would do it again. Well, they came back to do it again. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and could not find the body and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, look at the phrase, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. So first of all, you have two aspects of the resurrection to consider here. And the first is going to be pointed out by two angels. The second is going to be pointed out by Christ himself. And so they're perplexed by the circumstance. To be perplexed is they're confused. What is going on here? Why is there not a body here? Neither does the disciples nor the women who followed Jesus could bring into their minds what had taken place here. <clears throat> Even though previously, weeks before the resurrection of Lazarus for a short time beforehand, it should have been an excellent object lesson of what the power of the resurrection is. Even though Jesus himself at that event even said these words, I am the resurrection and the life. No one seemed to get the picture of what was happening. So then here's what happens. Two men stood by them in shining garments, and as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee. And so it's interesting. They simply, the angel simply said, uh, he told you this. Now, I don't know the character of angels, whether they have the capacity of being impatient. But in some ways, the angels are going, well, duh, yeah, he's gone. He said he was going to be gone. And so he was saying in effect to the ladies, he already told you this. They did what he, he did what he said he would do. And, you know, they did what he said they would do. And then he did what he said he would do. You know, that, so you picture the angels going, uh, what's the problem here? And then they even say this. Then they said, remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And so he went to prod the memory. You know what? And, and then look what happens here. Then it was, and they remembered his word. Now, I hope they rewind this videotape in heaven. Because I would love to see that aha moment spread across the face of the ladies as they realize, well, that means, and that means, and that means, you know, 
all of a sudden they realize it and you can imagine their reaction and everything. And in their excitement, they ran and told the disciples, probably to all talking to them at the same time. And guess what happened? They didn't believe them. It says, and their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. It would take a literal show and tell for them to finally accept what the ladies already did, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So that brings us, okay, I said, look to the message. The angel said to the ladies, look to the message, look to the message, look to the message. But then Jesus says, well, if you don't get that, look at me. Look at verse 36 of Luke chapter 24 as we go through here. And, and I find this interesting as um, we go through Luke 24, looking at verse 36. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. So you have the ladies who were perplexed by the circumstance. Um, they were pointed to Christ's words three days ago. They were prodded by the memory. And now you have the risen Christ and said, we're now looking to the Savior. We're now a few hours ahead. And so at this point, Jesus has already appeared to Peter, but he hasn't appeared to anyone else. We complain about doubting Thomas, but here's the reality. At this point, all the remaining disciples fill the bill of doubting Thomas right now, and then Jesus appears. So first we have the unrealized miracle. Jesus appears and says, peace be unto you. Okay, everything's going to be okay, right? Look at verse 37. But they were terrified and affrighted, supposing that they had seen a spirit. So the result, Jesus is back. Ah, look, everybody get away, everybody run. Wasn't really what we were expecting here, was it? Not exactly the desired result. They thought they were seeing an after-death disembodied spirit. As there are some accounts of people actually seeing their loved ones after death, and they think this is happening. And instead of them being excited, they are terrified. So Jesus says this after this happens. He says, and he said unto them, why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your heart? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is my, I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. And so you have this reality here. Jesus saying, hey, look at me. Look at me. I'm here. I'm him. He's literally saying, look this time to himself. And he's saying, I don't look like a ghost. I look like a person. And then he says this, I love it. And when he had thus spoken, he showed him his hands and his feet because he can tell they're having a hard time framing this. He's going, well, see, see, it's me. Look, 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 I have hands, I have feet. I'm not a ghost, though it'd be very interesting because when they looked at the hands, they'd see the scars. And when they look at the feet, they'd see the scars. But it's interesting. So he shows them everything, says, see, everything's okay. And guess what? Look what they say very next. And he said, And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered. You know how we always say this phrase in Christian circles? We talk a lot about our faith becoming sight or that we walk by faith, not by sight. This is one of those circumstances where it's the opposite. They're looking with their own eyes and they still do not have the faith. Talk about a hard crowd to convince. It's amazing. So he did this. Look what he did. He said, And while they yet believed not for joy and wonder, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? Means do you have any food? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and of a honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. And it's kind of like he said, okay, he resorted to the food test. And so he says, hey, give me some food. And then they're kind of all going, well, yeah, yeah, I guess, I, I guess ghosts don't eat food, do they? Nah, uh, uh, no, I guess not. 
And so it's amazing what it took for them to realize that their sight had to become faith. And then finally, their understanding had to become open. And so what we look here is it says this in verse 44, and he said unto them, these are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were spoken in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Their understanding had to be open. So Jesus takes them through the same process that the angels a few hours before had taken them with the ladies, literally expounding point by point how his betrayal, death, burial, and resurrection was the fulfillment of prophecy and of the scripture. So, if you are really in a search for the truth, then look for him. Look for Christ. Here's an illustration, Luke 19, verses 3 and 4, and we're talking about Zacchaeus. And it says, And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. He ran, therefore, and climbed up a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. The most important thing to Zacchaeus is that he wanted to see Jesus. In this series, Jesus has told us to look. The most important thing for you to look for in your life is Him. That is the Savior, Jesus Christ. Look for Him for relationship and look for Him for life. As the scripture says in Jeremiah 29, 13, And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Remember this and seek for the Savior with all of your heart. God bless you. We're taking a short break and the children's lesson will start in just a few minutes.